Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Stacy, and I'm the Communications Manager here at the Drexel Libraries. I just wanted to take a minute to thank you for joining us for this afternoon's webinar, which is called Incorporating Archival Material in Your Curricula, the Drexel Family Collections. And it's being presented by some of our archive staff, Simon and Molly. So today's webinar is part of the library's new event series called Wednesdays at Noon. And that series brings together our expert library staff and members of the Drexel community for weekly training sessions and discussions. We're hosting these through the winter and through the spring terms, I think up until the beginning of May, and we hope you'll join us for a future event. Now, as a quick reminder, I'm recording today's session as well as all of the other sessions. So if you miss something, you can always go back to our YouTube channel and watch it later. That's all I have to say. So without further ado, I'm gonna turn it over to Simon and Molly. Thanks guys. Thanks, Stacy. Share my screen. All right, um, so um, hello, I'm Simon Ragavan, the Archives Technician in the Drexel University Archives. And I'm Molly Reynolds, the Project Archivist for the Drexel Family Digital Archive. And uh, welcome to uh, our webinar, um, and thank you for attending. Um, so um, our, our um, our approach is that we, we don't think that archives um, are just for history majors. Um, uh, students across, um, sorry, um, students from across uh, different disciplines can, uh, can develop skills um, that are useful or essential in, in many different careers uh, using archival material. So in this presentation, instead of discussing how the Drexel family collections can be used to learn about specific subjects, uh, we're going to focus on the skills uh, you can help your students develop using these materials. And I'm going to note for people who view this as a recording in the future that we are delivering this webinar in March of 2021. Uh, and since we are actively developing our approach to uh, instruction with primary sources and are seeking new collaborations with faculty, um, some of the information in this webinar may you know, be outdated um, or we may simply be uh, better expressing our ideas. Um, so, all right, to make sure we're all on the same page, we'll first answer the question, what is an archives? An archives is where material of historic value is stored and made accessible to researchers. This most often means paper objects and photographs, as well as digital records. This material can be created by organizations, families, or individuals. And one part of the University Archives collecting scope includes records created by and about members of the Drexel family. Um, and so for more information about what archives are and an introduction to how to do research using uh, in archives, um, you could watch a recording of another webinar that's part of the series, which I presented previously, uh, and which is titled Using Archives. And Stacy is going to share the link to that in the chat. All right, so who was Anthony J. Drexel? For anyone who isn't familiar with the university's history, the school was founded as the Drexel Institute of Art, Science, and Industry in 1891. Founder Anthony J. Drexel was the head of the Philadelphia-based banking firm Drexel & Co., founded by his father Francis, an Austrian immigrant to the United States. Anthony Drexel was interested in establishing his legacy in a school that would provide practical and well-rounded vocational education for men and women in Philadelphia. Anthony had nine children with his wife, Ellen Rose, seven of whom lived to adulthood, so that the Drexel family tree grew very large over the next several generations. Anthony himself was a reticent figure and avoided public attention, but nevertheless, the family became prominent in the American upper class. So now that you've got some background on the Drexel family, um, I'm going to talk a little about why I and my colleagues in the University Archives uh, really want to collaborate with Drexel faculty and what we're hoping to achieve. Um, so uh, academic librarians have already developed best practices for instruction, as you probably noticed in working with Drexel library staff. However, this is not the case in the archival field. Best practices are currently emerging. Also, archivists usually work with faculty and students in history and humanities departments. When I was doing research on teaching with primary sources in the professional literature, I found far fewer examples of archivists working with faculty in STEM and in the arts. And while I think that archivists in general should expand their reach, it's especially important that we do so here at Drexel, where so many students are in various STEM programs or attend Westfall. 
Another thing that I think is useful to know is that archivists aren't usually subject specialists. What we're experts at is organizing and preserving archival material and at helping researchers find archival resources that are useful to them. Most archivists do have backgrounds in history or the humanities, and this is the case with all current uh, university archive staff. Also, archivists usually don't have significant pedagogical experience. What this means is that you, as faculty with expertise in your respective fields and with lots of experience teaching, are going to see all kinds of pedagogical potential in archival material where we won't. Um, and so the pandemic, uh, one of the results is that it has compelled many archivists, including us, to figure out how to teach with primary sources in classes that are conducted entirely online. Uh, a key feature of archives is that the vast majority of material is unique and only a tiny proportion of that is digitized. So since we're only able to rely on digitized versions of a relatively small number of items, that does create some limitations in what we're able to do, but we've also found that there are new possibilities. Um, so to sum up, uh, introducing students across the disciplines to archival material is, in, is innovative. Uh, teaching with primary sources online is also innovative. And on top of that, uh, in, we in the university archives have been reconceptualizing how we frame the potential of primary sources in teaching to emphasize the broad skills that students can develop with archival material. Um, and all this innovation is in keeping with Drexel's character now, but it's also in keeping with Drexel's long tradition of innovation in pedagogy. Um, so this is all very exciting um, for us, but innovating new ways to teach with archival material is something that we archivists can only take so far on our own. We need to collaborate with faculty in order to really explore the possibilities um, of archives and teaching. Um, so what kind of skills you know, do we think students can learn with archival material? Um, these are uh, the ones I'm going to discuss. Um, these are some of the skills that students can develop, um, and they aren't the only ones by any means, uh, and they do often overlap, but the purpose of this presentation isn't to be definitive or exhaustive. The purpose is to share some of our ideas about how Drexel family material might be used in teaching, uh, and hopefully to start you thinking about how this material might fit into an existing class, or even how you might build a new class around some part of the Drexel family collections. Um, so the first skill, we're going to discuss is visual literacy. And one way to define it, as you see on the slide, is an understanding of the history, conventions, and technology of still and moving images, and the ability to analyze and interpret them. Uh, to put it another way, um, what I'm talking about is um, interpreting still and moving images um, using the context of their creation, the culture and technology and agenda um, that influenced how they were created and why, uh, as the foundation for interpreting uh, what you see. And this skill also leads to knowing how to create and use visual media yourself to communicate your own ideas. Um, so visual li literacy is a key skill for many subjects and professions, and archival material can provide unique opportunities to sharpen that skill. Here are a few examples of Drexel family material that could be used for teaching visual literacy in a course, especially for students who are studying art and design. So here we have photos of family members ranging from the elaborate costumes of Gilded Age balls to more candid photos from family vacations. In the bottom left corner, you'll see a group of people attending the Bradley Martin Ball, considered the most expensive party ever thrown in New York in 1897. Stage studio portraits like the one of Minnie Drexel in ballet costumes seen in the middle can tell a lot about popular fashions, the history of photography, and how individuals wish to represent themselves. And then there are photos of the family during their travels and leisure time, like a mother and son skiing and a group walking on a beach. Besides learning about historic fashion, one can compare how Drexel family members choose to represent themselves in photographs during different eras and for different occasions. Oh, sorry. Um, the mouse wasn't responding, and there we go. Okay, there we go. The Drexel family home albums document the exteriors and opulent interiors of many of the houses owned by Drexels in Philadelphia in the late 19th century. These clearly have potential for architecture and interior design classes, but that doesn't mean they're limited to those disciplines. All of the albums have been scanned and can be seen on the Drexel University Archives digital repository, and Stacy's going to put the link in the chat now. Thanks, Stacy. 
Um, these particular photographs show the exterior and interior view of the dining hall in Anthony J. Drexel's West Philadelphia home at 39th and Walnut. And while his mansion was eventually torn down, two of the homes he built in the same area for his children are now fraternity houses on Penn's campus. So the next skill we're going to talk about is communication, and that's a very broad skill, and there's certainly a lot of ways to improve uh, different aspects of it. Um, but archival material created in a different, different era um, often lacks um, an immediately familiar context. Um, it was often created for a purpose that most of us now are unaccustomed to, and maybe for an audience that no longer exists. Um, and the format of the item itself may be unfamiliar or confusing. So um, this means that, you know, to answer questions like what the creator intended to communicate, what their biases were, um, when you're looking at an, an archival item from a different era, um, this requires a greater effort uh, than contemporary material tends to. The Drexel family collections include all kinds of published and unpublished documents communicating various kinds of messages. They range from correspondence from the late 19th and 20th centuries, like the two examples you see here, to legal documents covering multiple generations, to a scrapbook full of letters congratulating a couple on their engagement. The variety of documents can be used in myriad ways to challenge students to think critically about communication. Um, so the next skill is uh, dealing with uncertainty, and um, this may be less obvious or less self-explanatory than the previous two, um, but we all have to deal with uncertainty in the information we have available, and we all have to figure out what to do when we don't have enough information, whether it's finding a way to gather more or achieving a goal while working within the limits of what we do have. Um, archival material and research is full of uncertainty. Uh, it's completely unavoidable. Uh, archives do not have all the records ever created, not by a long shot. Um, and some parts of the historic record are never even contained on paper, in photos, or in audiovisual media in the first place. There are many gaps and silences. Material is biased or ambiguous. Uh, sometimes essential information, like who sent a letter or the data that a photo was taken, may be missing, and so on. Yeah, so like Simon said, there are some typical gaps in the historical record. For example, uh, records created by people who weren't wealthy are less common in many eras because often their access to writing material was limited. They had less leisure time to write. And what they did create was unfortunately less likely to have been seen as historically significant and worth preserving. Um, so, for example, we know hardly anything about the people who were employed by the Drexels in their homes or what those relationships were like uh, based on the family's records, with a handful of exceptions. Um, we have two, for example, we have two condolence letters about a man who served as the stable master for many years at Woodcrest Estate in Radnor. The most accessible information about most of the employees who surrounded the Drexels on a daily basis and who made their lifestyle possible is found in the census records, which contain valuable information, but little personal detail. Since the Drexels were a wealthy and prominent family in the 19th and 20th centuries, we have a substantial amount of archival material about them covering that time frame. Still, there's a major gap in the record since Anthony J. Drexel destroyed almost all of his personal correspondence prior to his death. Here you can see two of the few letters written by Anthony that we have in the archives. Some correspondence by him exists at other institutions, um, but there's no central location for studying the written correspondence of this influential figure. So while his business ventures and philanthropy are pretty well documented, it's hard to piece together other aspects of his life in his own words. Um, and learning how to navigate, uh, piece together, and interpret the fragments of uh, the fragmental um, archival record uh, can help students become more attuned to seeing the gaps and ambiguities in other information sources, um, can help them become more comfortable with uncertainty, uh, and more practice at moving forward despite it. Uh, one example of an assignment based on the Drexel family material would be finding more information that can help tell the story of the Drexel employees, uh, whether uh, that information is found scattered in the university archives collections or uh, by following threads to other sources. Um, so the next skill uh, we're going to talk about is skepticism. Um, 
working with our archival material could uh, help students really gra grasp that all the opinions and theories out there um, that they're learning about are based on the interpretation of data and that there's usually more than one way to interpret that data. Um, they can develop a keener awareness that other people create knowledge, fallible people with biases and limitations, um, uh, including knowledge that they may currently take for granted as being reliable and beyond questioning. Um, skepti skepticism has an obvious role in any career that involves research and innovation. Um, but in addition to that, um, uh, another, another important you know, use for that is that uh, once current students start their careers, they should be able to think critically about the best practices in their chosen field. Those best practices didn't just appear out of nowhere. They were developed over time. They aren't perfect. They will need to be questioned and they will continue to change uh, based on new information and different understandings of existing information. So a healthy skepticism is essential for questioning received wisdom, um, regardless of what career the students wind up in. One way, <clears throat> one way of approaching the skill of skepticism using archival material could be to compare and contrast the various formats of resources, both published and unpublished, that detail the lives and activities of Drexel family members. 19th and early 20th century society pages reported on prominent wealthy families like tabloids and social media cover celebrities today, documenting their parties, marriages, divorces, deaths, and scandals. The headline here, Rich Mrs. Drexel Forgives Her Prodigal Daughter, and the clipping titled Her Pathetic Romance Ends, are in reference to the scandals surrounding Alice Gordon Drexel in 1919 when she eloped with a naval captain to Paris before separating the next year. Contrasting these with documents showing how her family viewed her and her brief marriage would provide a different understanding of the same events. Another example is Cordelia Biddle's book about her father, A.J. Drexel Biddle Sr., uh, titled My Philadelphia Father, that paints him in an entirely positive light. In the 1960s, Disney adapted this book into a musical titled The Happiest Millionaire, which certainly doesn't document anyone's faults or tensions. Archival material showing, for example, tension between Biddle Sr. and family members would show a more varied and complicated person. Um, since the Drexel family collections uh, include material that portrays various Drexels from different perspectives, Students can compare items by and about the same individual meant for different audiences and created for different purposes. Discovering for themselves the sometimes vast differences in how a single person is understood in their own time can help students grasp why they can't rely on a single source of information and give them some practice in spotting the agendas and biases in, in specific sources. Uh, so the next skill uh, is gathering and analyzing data. Um, this is, of course, central to any kind of original research. Um, and archival material can provide practice at pulling quantitative and qualitative data from various kinds of archival records, and then using that data to create information. The Drexel family collections include a number of financial and legal documents, such as account books, wills, and estate inventories. Here we have a page from the Drexel & Co. ledger dated December 1883. An assignment based on these types of records might require students to locate the data relevant to their research question, transform it into a more usable format, and interpret it. Students could also use Drexel family documents that contain geographic information, such as family patriarch Francis Drexel's accounts of travels in Europe and South America, to create maps or other visualizations. Um, the Livingston Biddle photo albums created by Biddle around 1915 follow journeys taken on his uncle George Drexel's yacht, the Alcido. These albums provide an incredible view of both rural areas and cities in the Middle East, Africa, and Asia in the early 20th century and reflect the Drexels' own understanding of their place in society and in the world. At the top of the slide, there's a view of the Great Wall of China, and the lower photo was taken on a hunting expedition in Central Africa that followed the route of the then well-known Smithsonian Roosevelt African Expedition of 1909. Biddle's photos and captions describe the landscape, architecture, and people he encounters on his travels, and are both candid and at times anthropological, reflecting this specific period of colonialism and his perspective as a privileged white American tourist. 
These photos could also be used to create maps, but in addition, they could be a jumping off point to discuss environmental changes in specific area places, or for putting these voyages into the political, social, and economic context of the regions visited. So uh, the next skill is navigating online resources. Um, just because most current undergrads don't remember a time when computers weren't ubiquitous, uh, doesn't mean that they intuitively understand all things digital. Um, there are a lot of skills that people need in order to be really competent uh, at finding the information they want online, and working with archival material can be good practice for many of these. Yeah, so archival material can help make the limits of Google, Wikipedia, and YouTube clear to students who aren't accustomed to venturing outside of these most well-known online resources. Choosing an individual family member or other topic related to the family to investigate could help to teach students research skills as they could use our LibGuide on the subject, navigate the library's resources and databases, analyze whether resources are trustworthy, work with digital archival offerings from the university archives or elsewhere, learn to use finding aids, and identify when it's necessary to contact someone for help with research and access to materials. This gets them accustomed to figuring out how to use unfamiliar tools and resources for finding information. Uh, so hopefully uh, by now we've piqued your interest and you're wondering how this would work and what your next step would be if you wanted to explore um, uh, the options for how you might incorporate Drexel family material or other archival resources into your courses. So there's a lot of different ways to do this um, and uh, university archive staff would collaborate with faculty to figure out what would be most effective for their pedagogical goals. Um, we're currently developing an Archives 101 lesson plan uh, which can be modified to fit a specific class. And our focus um, has been so far to create an online version with, that can be delivered as a synchronous class or as an asynchronous module. The synchronous version would be led by Drexel University Archives staff. Um, and we will also create a version we can use when classes can visit our reading room again. Um, we are also happy to work with faculty to incorporate archival material beyond the Archives 101 class or to provide an introduction to archival research that is more tailored to a specific subject or curriculum, uh, and we could also provide support in developing new classes that have a focus on uh, using archival material. So as I've said before, this is a time of innovation, not just for the university archives, but for the field of archives more generally. Uh, and archivists can only accomplish so much on our own. Uh, if adding some thought-provoking assignments to an existing class is appealing, or if creating a truly unique class is exciting to you, um, then your next step would be to email us and start a conversation. All right, so to wrap up, we've provided some links to useful websites here. And of course, like Simon said, we encourage you to contact us if you wanna find out more about any of the material you've seen today. Our online resources include the Drexel Family Collection material available on IDEA, our current digital repository. The second link will take you to our archival collections database, which we share with the Academy of Natural Sciences and the College of Medicine Legacy Center. And we've included our Drexel Family Research Guide if you're interested in learning more about our holdings as well as Drexel Family related material at other repositories. And finally, the Drexel Family Digital Archive, a curated digital collection and exhibit, brings together objects from special collections across campus with University Archives material in order to give greater context and meaning to the Drexel legacy. This site has only recently been made public and material and exhibit pages are added periodically, but there's already a lot to explore there and I encourage you to check it out. Um, so that concludes our presentation and now we can take any questions you might have. Thanks.